Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Think about that for just a second. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to take this at a different angle today. I've kind of halfway spoke on this before. But uh, God's placed it on my heart to talk about it today. And uh, you don't go against what God places upon your heart to say. And uh, uh, there's, there's some rich stuff in here. When I say stuff, I mean His truth in here today. I'm going to be using an Old Testament example of this today, but I want you to think of that for just a second. Poor in spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Before the Lord God made man upon the earth, He prepared for him a creating and world of useful and pleasant things in His substance and delight. God created things, wonderful things, for man's use and delight. In the Genesis account of creation, these are called simple Things, and I keep re- I keep emphasizing, and I will continue to re-emphasize things. They were made for man's use. They were meant always to be external to man and subservient to man, for man to use, for man to enjoy. Like enjoying Florida State win a football game. <laughs> Embarrassed that A&M didn't do as good as they did. <laughs> but things. It's amazing how football can become a religion and a possessor. Not just football, a car. Not just a car, hunting, fishing. Those things God created for us to enjoy to do. He says, go kill and eat. We got to go. We, we, we have to eat. We have to do things. He gave us a good swimming hole to go swimming in to enjoy. He gave us a river to ride on to see beauty and creation. He gave us these things for our enjoyment. They were subservient to man. In the deep heart of man was a shrine, was a place that belonged to no one but God. Think of that for just a second. When man, when God created man, when He created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, He created all of these things. He said, Adam, name these animals, and he did. Saw the beauty of the Milky Way. Saw the beauty of the sunrise and set. Saw the Garden of Eden. 
saw his beautiful wife that he created for him. And she saw her handsome husband that was hers. They were things that were made, they were things that were given, they were things that created, that were created for man. The animals. What, just fill in the blank, whatever you want to fill in the blank there with. All of these things were created for man's use. God said you'd do anything that you want to do except eat of this tree in the middle of the garden. In the middle of the garden, he had to go through all this other stuff, all these other fruits, foods, whatever, to get to what God told him not to mess with, did he not? Put it in the midst of the garden, in the middle of the garden. God showered thousands, multiple thousands of gifts upon man. I can think of my granddaddy. And you go by there today, I'm sure, in his barn somewhere in the smokehouse, there's a coffee can <laughs> with nails. Granddaddy grew up in the Depression. You didn't throw anything away. I used to sit there with him and would straighten out nails. If you pulled a nail out of something, you didn't throw that nail away. You straightened that nail so you could use it again later on. Things were given unto man for us to use. Wood to build houses with. Asphalt to build roads with. You know, and, and as time has grown, 639 channels on the TV and ain't a thing on them to watch. Thank God for air conditioning. Thank God for our heaters too. And I pray for those that are having hot flashes and those that have to live with them that have hot flashes as well. May God give us grace and mercy. Hallelujah, amen, and thank you, Jesus. God showered these gifts upon man. I want you to, I want you to think about that and let that weigh heavy on your heart. Not heavy on your heart, but, but let it enter in to your mind that these things were given unto man as gifts to man from God. But there was a place in the innermost part of man, the shrine of man, the heart of man, the essence of man, the very being the chamber where the most important thing is supposed to be. Are you following me? The place in each man and woman where the most important thing is supposed to be. And it's not your Dodge pickup truck. It's not your King Ranch Ford pickup truck. It's not your Corvette. It's not your house. It's not your cabin on the river. It's not your cabin that you have wherever you have your cabin at. It's not things or it's not possessions that are supposed to occupy that place that is within each man and each woman, each person with a, well, to use the lack of a better word, I don't like this word or this term necessarily, but the age of accountability. That means have enough sense to know, put it that way. Uh, at an age that one is smart enough to be able to tell that they're, they're grown up. Okay, we're grown up, we're adults. It's time for us to make decisions. There's things that we have to do. 
Where are your priorities? Is your priority hanging out at the beach all summer long? Is your priority staying in the deer woods all deer season? Is your priority staying on the lake fishing? Is your priority staying in the cabin in the I want a cabin in the hills. I'd love to have one of those. Be nice. But you know what? All of these are things. Things. And I don't want and, and I want to take it a step further than things. They are blessings from God. I can remember as a kid. Uh, my grandmother had one of those old-timey washing machines. When I say old-timey washing machines, I'm talking about the old-timey one with the drum, and it had a ringer on the top of it that you'd feed clothes through. I have seen and not had to use, praise the Lord above, because he's given us a gift of one of them Westinghouse things. You can just throw it in there, pour the junk in it, mash the button, and let it run, and it washes your clothes for you. That's a gift. That is a thing. God has given us. He's not forgot about us. He won't forget about us. It's something that He's given us. It's something to be able to use. But I want you to think about this for a second. Our woes began when God was forced out of His central Shrine and things were allowed to enter. Think about that for a second. God has a well, you hear this saying, there's a empty void whatever within every man that's a or there's a God-shaped void within inside every man that needs to be filled. If you're saved, he's in there. All right? If you're not saved, he's not. You need to get him in there. But what happened with the devil? The devil wanted just a little bit of glory, did he not? Worship me just a little bit. Say, you know, sing unto me just a little bit. He wanted to share some of God's praises. What did God do? Kicked him out of heaven like a lightning bolt, did he not? Threw him down here to the dumpster of the planets called earth, and he's the small g God of this little world. He will not share his glory with anything. I want to step on some toes today. And not only yours, but mine as well. When I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. Things. How much have we let our family suffer for work? It's home. How much of our wives made our made their husbands suffer for whatever reason? How many husbands have made their wives suffer? whatever reason for things that don't make a hoot for nothing five years ago what were you saving up for that you just had to had to had to have and the world would stop if you didn't have it you can't remember can you but God never changes and God never fails Hang in there with me for just a little bit. Our woes began when God was forced out. What happened in the Garden of Eden? They had everything in the world that there was. Do you understand that? Yet no sin to tempt them. God just said, don't do this. Don't go get that thing. You don't need it. You got everything. Everything is provided for you. But no, man couldn't leave it alone, could they? Had to have it. 
Then all of a sudden, sin entered into the world. Through one man, sin entered into the world. But through one man, sin was taken care of too. That man is Jesus Christ. Took care of our sins for us. <clears throat> Listen. And this is the truth. I, 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 I lie not. Things have taken over. Why? This side used to be full. That side used to be full. This side's doing pretty good. There's reason people aren't in church this morning. I don't feel like getting up. Jesus didn't feel like jumping on that cross and getting beat to death and dying either, did he? But he did it anyway. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for it. He didn't, he divested himself of his glory. God, could you imagine Prince Charles or Queen Elizabeth or whoever becoming a commoner and sweeping a street? Think about it. Absolutely not. Because they're prideful. They wouldn't do it. But God divested himself of his glory and became a man. Some of these convicts on TV say that he was born rich. And then he had all this money in the world. That's those health and wealth and prosperity teachers teaching you that stuff. What did Jesus say? Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. Nowhere. God provided for Mary and Joseph to get to where they needed to be to have the consensus, to have their census because they bought gifts to them. They didn't have anything. They were poor. They rode, they had a donkey. When they sacrificed at the temple, they sacrificed the lowliest of all the sacrifices you could sacrifice, which was a dove. They didn't have a prize Santa Gertrudis bull to bring up there to sacrifice. Money is a thing that has taken place of that place of majesty where God belongs. Things have taken over. Men have now by nature no peace within their hearts. Why do you not have peace in your heart this morning? Because guess what? God's not king of your heart this morning. Yeah, we might be saved, but we got other stuff that we've got to do. Other things that we need to do. Wesley, shut up so we can hurry up and get out of here because this, that, or the other. Bless God, I ain't coming back tonight. I come once. I gave my hour to an hour and a half to God. What if this were food? Amen. I was waiting to hear that. It is food. And what if you only ate once a week? You came at, came at 11 o'clock to get your, your pizza or your whatever. You'd, at 10.45, you'd be beating the door down so you could come and get it because you're starving, slammed to death. You've got to feed on the Word of God every day because that's right and that's what God wants. Every day, eating of the Word of God, relying on the Word of God, restoring back that place that is holy that's within each and every one of us that belongs to God. We let it go. We, we let our kids go because we want to be their friends. We don't want to chastise them. We don't want to do this. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do the other. And we're doing them more harm than good. Amen. 
We have no peace because God's crowned place within our heart is taken over by things. By things. There's moral dust, stubborn and aggressiveness fight among themselves for the place that is the throne of God within each and every one of us. Now we can't take God's, we, can't, we cannot usurp His throne that is in heaven because we can't get there. When we become saved, we talked about it in Sunday school class this morning, He becomes the earnest money that is within us, the down payment for us. He lives within us, the Spirit of God lives within us. But there's a fight that's going on inside. Paul even says it when we read Romans 7, 8, and 9. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? There's a war that's going on between the flesh and the spirit, and it don't stop. It does not stop. You that say that you're perfect, you that say that it's not, well, I don't do bad, I don't do whatever, God... Bless God, how holy I am. There's nothing that's going on. Your, your feet smell because you're not telling the truth. There's a war that's going on. And the devil is trying to steal your joy, trying to steal your happiness. He's trying to take that spot of God's that's within your being away and trying to put things, whatever things happens to be to you and for you in His place. How easily we are distracted from the things of God. It's easy to get distracted from the things of God. I can fix it tomorrow. I can fix it next week. I can fix it tonight. I can fix it after a while. I can fix it whenever. We get distracted from the things of God. With each human heart, there's a long, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. Be careful what you pray for. And I say that because I'm a perfect example. God, you ha- you've heard me say this many times. Let revival start and let it start with me. Take that from my heart that is in your way. Pull it out by the roots, but give me the mercy to endure. Watch out. Because he'll do it. Watch out. Because it's tough. Watch out because it's hard. But guess what? He's always there. He's always there and he will. And I'll pray that prayer again. And I will pray that prayer again. Get the stuff out of the way that takes the place of you, God. Get the horses out of the way. If that is in the way of you, God, take them out of the way. If whatever it is is in the way, get it out of the way. Pull it out by the root, but give me the mercy to endure. Sometimes you can lay there and cry and wondering if you can endure. But guess what? You can. God wants his place back. God wants you. You said to him when you become saved, God, the best way I know how, I turn from my ways and I turn to you. I give you my life. Guess what? You just sold yourself to God. And that's a wonderful thing. He just saved you. I've heard it said and it makes me so mad. Well, you can't come here because you're not saved. 
Or you can't come there because you're saying, I had, nine and I had a, a young lady show up at a place we were before, said that they told her not to come back to church. She got saved and fixed herself. This church is a hospital for the sick. You hear me? We're not supposed to let sin run rampant in here. That's our responsibility to stop that mess. And we're going to do a better job at it. You hear me, men? If you hold a position in this church, do it. If you're a deacon, be a deacon. If you're a Sunday school teacher, be a Sunday school teacher. If you're a youth leader, be a youth leader. If you're a song leader, be a song leader. If you're the, if you're the camera pointer, point the camera. Do it not for yourself, but do it for God. Do it for God. It's a gift. It's, he, he needs us to do it. He's got to have workers. We are his hands, we're his feet, we're his glory, we're all those things. Now let me, before I get bogged down here, great day, y'all got a lot of sitting to do for me to get five minutes more in. Okay, but our fallen nature is to possess, it's to covet things. That's one of the top ten, do not covet. But oh, I want this, oh, I want that. And we get to thinking about wanting this or wanting that and forget about what's most important, do we not? It's the truth. So-and-so has got a fence around their place Dead gum it all I got is a barbed wire fence. I wished I had a, a nice white fence with the electric gates that would open up when I pushed the button and it had a I had an A on it when you come in. Oh, that's a nice gate. And you get to thinking about that and get to feeling sorry for yourself because you don't have one of those and all you got is a barbed wire fence. Thank God you got a barbed wire fence and thank God you got a place to put barbed wire around. But we can't be that way. We can't be content. The devil won't let us. The flesh won't let us. We're too worried about other stuff than to worry about what's important. God is the most important. And it's easy to get distracted from God being the most important thing. God's gift... Now takes the place of God. The things that God gave us to enjoy, the things that God blessed us with, the things that God allowed us to have, takes the place, the shrine, the holy part within us that God occupies. Now God has to share that space with whatever. But guess what? God ain't going to share. He'll fix it. He'll get rid of it one way or the other. Now let's see what he says here. To allow the enemy to live is the end to lose everything. To give it all up for Christ's sake is to lose nothing. Think about that for just a second as I read on here. But to preserve everything into eternal life. And possibly also a hint is given here that as to the only efficient way to destroy this foe of lust Pride of the eye, pride of the face. You know what those three are, the ones that God used, or that, that uh, he's talked about with, with, with Adam and Eve. Pride of, the, pride of life, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye. He killed it on the cross. He paid for it on the cross. And we let it seep in. What did Jesus tell us to do? He said, pick up your cross and follow me daily. 
It is a daily thing. How can we do this on a daily basis when we don't read the Word of God daily, when we have nothing to do with God except for showing up on Sunday morning? We might think about Him a little bit during the week or whatever the case may be. But it's daily. It's a daily fight. It's a daily struggle. Because the devil wants your soul, but he can't have it because... Jesus bought it on the cross. And he's mad about it. So he's going to do every, everything he can to mess it up. The blessed poor are no longer slaves to the tyranny of things. They have broken the yoke of the oppressor, which is, which is Satan, which is the devil. And this they've done not by fighting, Look at this into these words here. But by surrendering, though free from all sense of possessing, yet they possess all things. Let me say that again. God paid for us. God purchased us. God bought us on the cross. The devil and the flesh fight wanting to fulfill all of these and to get all of these things. So there's the war that goes on between the flesh and that goes on within the spirit. And that that you feed grows. If you feed the flesh, the flesh will grow. If you feed the spirit, the spirit will grow. Let me take it another step further and, and, and break it down to you a little bit so that you can see an example of this to a godly and to a righteous and to a holy man that this happened to. In the Old Testament, I'm going to give you an example of this beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is one of the beatitudes. What happened when Abraham became Ab or Abram became Abraham? God said, Abraham, Abraham, after he became Abraham, he says, I'm going to give you a son. And he says, This son's going to give you so many grand youngins. That there are going to be more than the stars. There are going to be more than the, you could count the sands of the, of the beaches. You could count how many grand youngins you're going to have. I'm going to give this to you. See, that's a blessing. That is something that God gave to Abraham. Abraham was a godly man. He was a godly man. And Abraham says, I'm going to give you these things. But what happened? Something happened, did it not? The baby that he gave him represented everything that God, you know, all of our things, stuff. And not only that, his promises unto us. He said, never have my children been forsaken or their children wanting for bread. Ever. He says, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. And he will. But we get worried about stuff and things and all, etc., and it gets our focus off of what is important, and that is of God. <laughs> One day, God showed up. He says, he gave, he gave him a son, Isaac, and it was a gift. He had, Abraham was a rich man. Abraham had herds. He had flocks. All kind of the Camelacs. 
He had all kind of stuff. He had, every, he had everything in the world. He was a wealthy man. He had caravans. Not talking about a Dodge caravan either. But he had, he, he had lots of things. But God promised him a son. And oh, how he loved that promise that God gave him. But guess what? That promise, that gift that God gave him started to become more important than God. It possessed his every thought. It possessed his everything. It usurped the holy shrine of God within Abraham. Abraham possessed things, stuff. There's nothing wrong with having things and stuff. I want to make that clear. God gave them to us to have and to enjoy. But God will share his glory with nobody, with nothing. Your bass boat ain't going to take his place. Your whatever is not going to take his place. You forget about him. He'll get your attention. You hear me? Two people heard me. He says, Abraham, take now thy son. Thine only son, Isaac, listen, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. Could you imagine the shock that went through Abraham? <laughs> what are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? You promised me this son. You said that through him is my seed, and I'm going to have enough seeds to, if I, you could count the stars, you could count the seed. If you could count the grains of sand, you could count how many grand youngins I'm going to have. Have you lost your mind? Have you gone crazy? He didn't say that, but that's the Wesley Adams version of it. In the Wesley Adams version, he said it. But with that being said, the Bible spares us of the things that was going on through Abraham's mind. But you know what Abraham did? Yes, you do, because you all know the story. He loaded up his son. He took one of his servants... See, he had servants. And he said, load up some wood because we're going on a trip. We're going to go sacrifice up on the mountain. Isaac said, word sacrifice. What did God say? I mean, what did, I, what did Abraham say? Amen. The Lord will provide. Could you imagine the struggle going on in Abraham's heart? Listen, his heart, his inner being, his shrine, where God dwelt and where God was, and God is. You want me to kill my young? <laughs> my son? Here he is. Think about that. He's fussing about it. Which rightfully so, you know, we as human beings would think and we would do. He's fussing about it. He's thinking about it in his mind, in his heart. God, what are you doing? What are you talking about? Have, what's going on? In obedience, he, was, he went on about it. We read about him in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 because of what he did. He had taken... God's place. He had taken God's spot. He had became more important necessarily than God. All of his thoughts, 
all of his things was thinking about Abraham, uh, thinking about Isaac instead of God. God says, I'm not going to share my glory. I'm going to teach you something, Abraham. Does that seem morbid? Does that seem like a morbid God? We serve a jealous God. God is jealous. He will not share his glory with anything or with anybody. God is God and we're not. I couldn't imagine what Abraham was going through as he went toward the mountain, taking his son with him. He knew that if God was to, if he was to kill the, the Bible tells us this. He knew that if he were to, were to slay Abraham, I mean his son, that God had raised him back from the dead, so he went anyway. He was obedient unto God. He was a godly man. He was a righteous man. Yet everything was revolving around his son instead of revolving around God. I know I'm going a long way around to get to this, but I'm trying to beat a point home. When he came up to the point of no return, when could you imagine the look on his son's face as he was binding him up after they had put the firewood upon the altar? After he set his son upon it and then bound his son? Could you imagine what it would be like to pull your case knife out? Because that's what I'm sure he told it as well. Because he had gifts and he had things. He would be a case knife. As he pulled that out to take his son's life. I, it was to the point of where he had it out of the sheep. It was to the point of where he was about to make the blow. An angel of the Lord stopped him. Just in the nick of time. And what did he see? A ram. A male sheep with his horns hung up in the thicket. God provided for him. He was willing to give up everything for his God. We can't even give up an hour but one hour, maybe one and a half hours of our time a week to God. We can't give up time to read this. I'm th kind of thankful for this because Nana would fuss at me with the light on at night, so she bought me this thing and I can read off of it and I read it. And that's one of the things that God convicted my heart of. I could tell you more about Indian stuff and cowboy stuff and whatever stuff because I started reading more of that than I did the Word of God. I'm saying that before you. Not anymore. I'm putting as much, I'm putting more effort and energy in reading the things of the Word of God than I did about that and history and civil war and those sort of things. Because that was starting to take the place of the things of God within my life. Things, other things, stuff taking you away. Any way, anything the devil can send to get you away from the word of God, to get you away from praying, to get you away from walking with him, to get you away from talking with him in the cool of the day. Anything to take, anything to usurp that holy place within you. The devil will do. Here, God provided as Abraham was about to make the sacrifice. And God provided the lamb for him to slay. And he cut his son loose and they sacrificed that lamb that God provided upon that altar that was to be Isaac's place. Think about this for a second. Abraham already had everything 
in the known world that there was to have, did he not? He had, all the, he had all the possessions, he had slaves, he had this, he had that, he had all of those things. He had the son that God promised him. He had it. Guess what Abraham did? Abraham gave it back to God. And guess what God did? He gave it back. He owned everything, but possessed nothing. Think about that for just a second. He owned everything, but possessed nothing. He understand that all good things come from God. He understood that all things are from and of God. They were His. And he could, have, he could have reveled in them. He could have did whatever. He could have bathed in His gold or in His whatever and did whatever or whatever He wanted to have done with it. But He didn't. He could have said, God, you have lost your mind. I am not sacrificing my son. That is crazy. But he was obedient unto God. And to the la at the last minute when it seemed like there was no hope and he was going to have to send his son or kill his son, God provided. He gave his son to God and God gave it back to him. But not only that, he gave him everything else which was already his that God gave him. He owned everything and yet possessed nothing. He gave it all away because why? He understood that it was God. On this same mountain, on this same hill, one time, God gave His only begotten Son so that you and me could have everything in the world and possess nothing. He just wants us to give it back to Him. He wants you to give your life to Him. He wants you to give your family to Him. He wants you to give everything to Him. It's His anyway, do you understand? Everything that you have is His anyway. He gave it to you and He'll take it away. Give it back to Him. And he gives it back, and it's yours. I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth here. Owning everything and possessing nothing. We are who we are because God has made us that way. Did I choose or did I make the color of my eyes? No, my Creator did. Did I make how much hair or lack thereof that is on my head? No, my Creator did. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made as well as you are. Be content with what you have. Be content with what God gives you. Give it back to Him because it's His anyway. Thank God He didn't take His Son back. If God would have said, no, I'm not going to let my only begotten son be killed on that hill for that bunch of lying, whoremongering, thieving, whatever adjective you want to use to describe mankind, no, I'll not do it. There's no way I'd sacrifice my daughter for some bum in the street. Thank God I'm not God. He did for the drug addict. He did for the alcoholic. He did for the sick in mind, for the sick in heart. He did for the sinner, for the lowliest of sinners. He gave his only begotten son. But guess what? He didn't stop when it was time to die. He allowed him to die. Why? Because there was no other way that man could be redeemed 
back unto him, but through Jesus Christ. Because of what he did for us, we can have everything and possess nothing. Because of what Jesus did for us, we can have their life everlasting. Because of what he did for us, we can enjoy the things that he has given us, the bass boat that he's given us that I ain't got one of, that I'm going to steal yours if I have to. Going hunting out in God's beautiful country. Going to the cabin in the mountains. Going to see the Grand Canyon or the Redwood Forest or the saguaro cactus out in Arizona. Going and seeing the beauty that God has given us. Those things are gifts that he's given to us to be able to see and to be able to, to do whatever with because they're gifts for us that we can enjoy. God gave us the offer of eternal life. Don't squander that away. That hole that's within, that throne, that shrine that is within each and every one of us is God's. If you're not saved this morning, that's what's wrong with you. Is God wants to save you. If you are saved and you couldn't tell the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, are you saved this morning? If you don't feast upon the bread of God, you're starving to death for something this morning and you wonder what's wrong with you. Why am I so spiritually weak? Why am I so this way, so that way, so the other way? Feast upon the things of God. Abraham had his son. He had all those things. He gave them back to God. No strings attached. And God gave them back to him and they were his. Owning nothing but possessing everything. Do you possess Jesus this morning or does he possess you? He has bought he has paid the price already on the cross of Calvary. He gave his life so that you and I can have life everlasting, no strings attached, and owning it. All he asks for is for us to receive. And then when we receive, let him be God of our lives because he has bought us and paid for us with a price, and we are his servants. And let him have a holy place in your life, and in your soul, and in your body. That is his. What's in the way between you and God right now? Music